Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Tim Cusick. I am the Training Peaks WCO4 product leader, and we'll be uh, taking you through tonight's webinar. Um, let's jump right in. I delayed there a little bit because I saw some people still joining, but it looks like it's uh, pretty joined now. It's great when we do these uh, a little more focused at the Euro time. Uh, it's great to see everybody that I'm only really communicating with on Facebook. Uh, it's great to see half of the group on here is, if not all, but at least I recognize from the uh, WKL4 power users on Facebook. Real quick, if you're not part of the power user group, go to Facebook right now, search WKL4 power users and join that group. Um, it's a thousand plus people strong, some really smart users and analytical coaches and exercise physiologists and all kinds of great exchange of information, so go ahead and join it. Okay. Um, it looks like we have those that are going to join us, so I'm going to jump right in. Quick little uh, announcement. We're changing the format of our webinars, even though it's not always uh, my ability to deliver this. We're doing two different formats. We're going to do a shorter 30-minute format, which is really more of a topic overview, high-level learning uh, type of deal. So when we tackle like a topical approach like Cyclocross, the idea here is to just provoke some thoughts, show you some ideas, give you some insight. And really, it's more about you know some quick opinions and information exchange. We are also going to do educational formats, which we've been doing, which are the longer 60-minute webinars, um, which are topic learning. But it's really more drilled down and based on uh, physiology or science or the science of physiology, exercise physiology, and more of a step-by-step -step learning. Now, that being said, I rarely hit the timeline. My 35 minutes is going to be 45, and my 60 is going to be 75. But that's because you know, I'm pretty much open for taking questions as we go. How we do that is you'll find a little arrow here, a little tab on the right-hand side of your uh, screen. If you open that tab, find the questions box. Yours might be closed. It'll have a little plus right here. Click on it. It'll open up your questions. You can type a question here, which will show up on my other screen. And I like to ask answer questions as they go. A lot of times I just weave them right into the presentation. So I'm kind of answering the question, but I'm not announcing, you know, like so-and-so has a question and putting it out there. So feel free, ask them as we go. I'll answer them if I can. Sometimes I'll stop. If, it, uh, if I stop talking for like three or four seconds, you guys might think I fell asleep. I might be reading a long question. So try to keep your questions pretty, you know, short and concise. But ask them as you go to come back like a half an hour later to a point that was made, you know, a half an hour ago, I think uh, loses some of the translation. So ask me as we go. I'm pretty good at kind of blending them right in. I also want to let everybody know before we start that this is my opinion. So in certain, when we're doing, you know, full analytical reviews or uh, we're doing something based on exercise physiology and science, you know, there's a science behind it. And I do believe there's a science behind my opinion, but, you know, really I'm just sharing some gained knowledge and, you know, some of the experience and wisdom that I've had, and obviously trying to show you how, with a focus, to use analytics. See, when Kevin and Andy and I, when we really started WKO4, the goal, you know, particularly driven by Kevin, was to get people to be able to think for themselves. Not that people weren't, but there weren't a lot of good tools that gave coaches and self-coach athletes the ability to look at things the way they wanted to. You often had a report, it had very limited control, and then you got this output of numbers. Our goal was to give everybody the ability to think about stuff on their own. And that's why we're doing all this, kind of show you how to build your own analytics. Okay, so let's jump in and talk about cyclocross. Whenever we're talking about any specific um, field in cycling or something that we're talking about, whether it's cyclocross or crit racing or mountain bike, we always have a common, for me as a coach, I always have a common starting point. I always start with this idea in mind when I look at any of these situations as far as coaching in the field, or even if I was training myself. Demand of the event, ability of the rider. That's where everything starts. You need to know what it takes to be successful in the type of event you choose, and you need to be realistic and honest about the ability of the rider to meet that demand. It's only when you start by taking a look at some that type of uh, equation do you uh, begin to understand. So let's talk about the key demand of the event of cyclocross. So I'll start off 
right off the get-go of maybe breaking some of kind of the standard practices, maybe even myths, um, but I'll tell you what to me is important. So I always break down when I'm thinking of command or demands of the event, I like to break it down into like the way my brain thinks and I'm very compartmentalized. To me, the primary keys of success within um, Cyclocross are driven by what we now call in the COG and I levels, FRC slash FTP. Now the reality is if you compare this, and I actually have a slide um, that kind of does it, I'll jump to it, whatever, we'll jump ahead a little. If you remember this, I've shown this in a couple of times, when we look at this slide, I want to see if there's markers on it. So here's the old Coggin levels. So we see the six levels, and seven was never really a training level because it really was just a, ma a total maximal effort. So the reality is if you look where VO2 max resides, it's very similar to what we now call FRC, FTP. This is a little broader, actually, if you look at it, but the reality is it's very similar in its nature. Well, the reality of, you know, for what it takes and a demand of cyclocross, that is a higher demand than most people realize. A lot of people might immediately jump in uh, to some type of anaerobic capacity view, which is similar. Be careful because VO2 max is um, highly, VO2 max is a, a cap of that, as you know, um, well, it's, I'm sorry, it's a cap of your aerobic fitness, but, or your aerobic ability, but it's related to when you're kind of going anaerobic, anaerobic, um, which I'll explain deeper later to avoid the, uh, the discussion argument. So I find that to be very important. When you look at successful cycle across racers, they actually have a much higher VO2 max than people realize, because we get very focused on that shorter type of one minute type of thinking because of the repeatability needed. Two, you need threshold. So threshold is, a high threshold is an indicator of success in any cycling event, so let's just say that right off the bat. But the reality, it's important here in um, cyclocross also. Uh, the reality is what happens all the time, I get this question, people explain to me, when they come to me and say, look, I want to be good at cyclocross, you know, what could I do or how could I improve? I always ask this question first. I, I do this for a lot of sports. Tell me how you lose. See, most, most athletes don't know how they win or when they can articulate it. They don't articulate it in physical performance terms. They tend to do it in tactical performance. So if you ask an athlete how they win, they'll tell you, you know, I sat in, I waited for the last corner, I attacked coming out, and I sprinted to the finish. Well, that, that's tactical. Ask them how they lose, and they'll actually give you some insight into their physical limitations. So when I ask people that question in cycle cross, I get this answer all the time. Well, you know, I went out with the group from the start line. And it was up, down, up, down. It was, you know, hard for 30 seconds and easy for 30 seconds and hard for a minute and easy for a minute and hard for 30 seconds. And it was just the repeats. And the repeats wore me down. And eventually, I just, you know, it was one more surge and I couldn't go with them. And they rode away from me. You'll hear that frequently. Two things drive that. One I'm going to talk about later. But the first off, when people say that to me, I say, send me your file and I'll show you something. And I could literally send it to them in an email and I generally know what I'm going to see. That up-down nature of the start lasted about 12 to 14 minutes before they cracked, before they couldn't make that next surge. And the reality is when you look at the normalized power, which is at that time frame, you got to be careful of trusting it, but you usually can. And look at the, you know, um, variability, all of which I'm going to get into a little deeper. That person was over threshold, typically by more for, you know, three to by more than three to five percent for that time range. And what really popped them, one of two factors was they were just over threshold for that time frame. Second one is fatigue resistance, which I'll go into later. Other primary is muscular endurance. Um, because of the nature of cyclocross, having a muscular endurance is a high demand. Secondary is what I would call FRC Pmax. So there I do see a punch of the pure neuromuscular power side being important and the ability to generate strength force. And this, when you start talking about strength force, I'm talking about a quadrant analysis approach more so than a metabolic approach. Um, it's not about the TSS or the metabolic response. It's about time in quadrant, which I'll go into. A supportive 
need, a demand, is they need an aerobic base. Now, we all know cyclocross isn't a high endurance sport. It's not a high aerobic. It's part of its popularity, right? Six, seven hours a week, you can train. Five hours a week, you can train. You can do okay. The race lasts for up to an hour, you know, maybe a little bit more, and you do all right. It's not a high demand. You don't need a high aerobic base. But it is a supportive demand because what a high aerobic base or a good aerobic base or a solid aerobic base allows you to do is actually do more high intensity training because it'll help you recover quicker and withstand the demands and the punishment of high intensity training. So you'll see later, I'll give a quick overview of some periodization. I'm not against doing some aerobic work if you can and have the time. It's supportive in nature. It'll help you train a little harder and all cycling is an aerobic sport. I mean, the reality is it's there just not the biggest bang for the buck. It's not the biggest demand of this event. Less effective to me in the demands of this event is tempo. Tempo is not a high demand in cyclocross. Um, think about it, how much time you spend in tempo zone. Look at your cyclocross files. You pass through it a lot. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you're doing this and this, but you don't spend a lot of time averaging in tempo. Um, and I'm sure some people do, you know, and maybe the right course forces you into that. But the reality is that you don't see that that much. Active recovery. You don't spend a lot of time in an active recovery zone in um, cyclocross. You kind of do, right? You might spend some time on the lower side because you're rolling down an off-camber hill, but that's not what I mean here. I mean literally pedaling in the active recovery or, or targeting active recovery. Less effective is quadrant analysis yeah, zone four. Um, you know, to have this ability to generate a unique type of power, I'll get into quadrant analysis here in a little bit, isn't needed. And things like stamina really aren't that important here. So to me, when you're thinking about these demands, also I have this kind of, cyclocross is what I like about it. I've raced it, I've coached it, I've coached a master's national champion, but it's not really my forte. I should have put that up front. I mean, I, I have some experience in it, and uh, it's just not something I heavily engage in. Um, I raced it for like a year or two. I come from a mountain bike side, so it was a national natural transition. Um, just never got into it because my season, I don't like the all year training, I like a little downtime. So the reality is, what I like to think about cyclocross though, it's a raw endurance sport. Meaning, it's a certain amount of just brute strength, right? If you're that type of rider who just, you're, you're a hammer and everything's a nail, cyclocross tends to fit you, right? Even more than a crit or something, uh, you know, some of the more kind of aggressive racing formats. Cyclocross is just it. If you're just like going hard and beating the tar out of a course and, and going deep and, and feeling the pain, it's a very raw version of it. So in that case, you just need to focus on that core 90% of what matters. What I see creeping into cycling cross, people overthinking it. And this overthinking, even though I'm going to show you unique data analytics, but the reality is the overthinking actually is a barrier. You're trying for too much perfection and too much precision and too much exactness. Cycling cross is raw. It's brute strength. It's tough person instinct. Leave it be that. Focus on the big things that matter. When I look at cycle cross, it also fits within something that I always kind of talk about, the hour event. You can have a 40 kilometer time trial, a crit, and a cyclocross. So let's just talk about this comparison because it's part of the demand of the event. If you looked at your average heart rate from the three of these, they would all be at threshold. Just always happens, it is what it is, they're going to be at threshold. The reality is the, if you, in a heart rate measurement, the demand looks exactly the same, which is one of the reasons using heart rate alone is not a great way for tracking exercise and performance. If you looked at the average power of these three, they would generally be at FTP. And this is why one of the things that Andy and myself, and we're trying to get people, to, and Kevin, are trying to get people to be slightly less focused on FTP is everything, and a little more focused on the demand and the specificity of what we're looking for. I'm going to give you an example. What we see really mattering is what happens here. Now, I shortened this list for the meeting. If you look at VI, variability index, average power, normalized power to average power, it's, you know, a time trial, it's very close. It's a 1.0. Your average power and normalized power are usually very close because it's a smooth, steady state effort. In crits, it can average like 1.3 to 1.5. Now, don't get me wrong, there might be, I've seen them as high as 2. You know, you have a right course with the right number of corners, the right complexity, and the right 
aggressive riding, it's going to go higher. I'm just generalizing. So you see this higher demand, the normalized power is usually uh, somewhat higher, almost significantly higher than um, their average power. Cyclocross, though, that has one of the highest VIs. And this gets lost because one of the things that's happening, one of the things that drives it is you're getting off the bike and running and you're creating no power time frames, right, while you're running. And then you're jumping back on and you're highly exploding. It's a slightly different type of VI you generate and it doesn't always get picked up by the data. If you're doing a lot of running, it, it, it can get lost a little bit in the shuffle because of the run nature itself. But the reality is the VI comes in what I call pulse, which is this line. And the reality of pulse is, you have very, what I mean is the up-down nature of it. So if you think about a crit, a crit has a variable pulse that's shorter, but higher. So you tend to have higher highs, low lows, and they only last a little bit. You do this. If you look at the power file, it looks more like this, right? Because you're going into a corner, you're slowing, breaking, you're sitting in, you're exploding out to either make a gap or cover a gap, right? And then you're off the gas and you're coasting in because you can be efficient. You're on a road, it's going fast, you might be sitting in, so the power is that. In cross, the VI is driven more by terrain. So you're not as high, but you're longer than you're down. And you're not as low, you might have to keep pedaling to keep the bike moving just easier for a little bit because you're going down a hill or the terrain allows it. Then you're up, but not quite as high. It goes like that. So that's what I mean, it's longer, and it's, but it's not quite as high. And the way I talk about that in VI power demanded is in crits are extended. Here it's extensive. Extended is this way. Extensive is this way. So in that simple way, that's the demanded event to me. When I look at the ability of the rider, I'm looking at some key functions, some that I want to be good, some that I'm not that interested in. But you're going to get asked, so I put them on my list. So Pmax, yeah, it's important, but it's not a key driver. How do I measure that? Pmax or just max power. Pmax is a model-driven max power, it's just max. As I stated, FRC, FTP is very important. That's my number one. I'll show you some reasons why, by the way, I'm going to go deeper into this. How I measure that is their FRC number, their actual VO2 or measured VO2, and a five-minute test is another way to show it. What am I looking for? If our scores, FRC above average, five-minute power above average, and something I'm going to show you here, five-minute power against WAC. When you compare their five-minute power against world-class five-minute power, what happens? I'll show you. FTP is important, weights heavily for me. I'm looking at MFTP, but I'm also looking at a 40-minute test. Now, yes, I know, and we can open the 60-minute FTP argument, but I'm going to give you a little idea here. Sometimes FTP, you know, is we search for this magic FTP so difficultly or so uh, diligently because it's everything, that it, you're actually sometimes better off looking at the number. Here's an example. I've had at least a thousand arguments, positive discussions, I should say, certainly not arguments, of 20 minutes, a maximum 20 minutes, times 0.95 is your FTP. That's true for a certain amount of people because the 95% is an average we were seeing, you know, back in the day when we didn't have a better way to measure it. So now that we have more and more accurate ways and we're showing people more accurate ways, there's still a lot of people who clings to that. And they might fit in that, they might not, right? It's a, it's a generalization. It was an estimate. But I have people that have listened, talk to people, I'm like, well, how many times do you 20-minute test? And I'm like, every three or four weeks. And then I say, okay, so what are you testing? And they're like, well, I guess I want to know if I'm getting more fit. That's great. So why don't you just use your 20-minute power? If your 20-minute power is going up, you're getting more fit. You're just using it as a surrogate. For some reason, we've gotten so locked into extending that, you're not actually thinking about the actual power that you're putting out as a measurement. So I, at Cyclocross, I look at a 40-minute test. I look at its relationship to MFTP, but I focus more on a 40-minute test. Then I look at that 40 minutes against world class, against WAC. Again, I'm going to show you. Aerobic base, important. If we're starting scratch or I can affect it, I like it. You know, I'm kind of in that range. If we get it, great. If not, it's not a not killer. Muscular endurance, important. Repeatability, not tempo. So when I'm talking about muscular endurance here, I'm talking about a fatigue resistance style. These two are related. I want the person to have a high FRC and the ability to go hard, 
go easy, go hard, go easy, go hard, and put them in a certain amount of repeatability. So I want their muscular endurance. I have a specific test to failure that I use to find out if this works or not, which I'll go over with you. Time to exhaustion, stamina, not that important. TTE might help, and I already got this question. TTE, TTE time to exhaustion, helps us understand the person's threshold, and are they able to extend, and it also helps us understand their fatigue resistance in here. So TTE, you know, it's a good point that the Question, the person who put the question in made, it really is more important to me. I'm considering it as part of other things, but I didn't, I don't really see it as a standalone importance, so maybe I need to update that because it is part of the fatigue resistance. So what I'm looking for in fatigue resistance is the decline between this 5 and this 40 in the WAC test. I'm going to show you. I have in here, since I put it here, the FRC above standard. I'm typically looking, because the FRC is the easiest one to see, it's in a hero bar, it's easily generated, it's there. So usually what I'm looking for is in the standard, about the middle of the medium to high and up. So, you know, if you can see that, you know, I'll, take that, I'll take that out of there so you can see what I put in there. You know, it's in that range. So maybe like 15 and above for men, and maybe like 12 and above for women. That doesn't mean you can't be successful at cyclocross below that, it's just not the most naturally suited event for you. You might have a super high threshold and not a big FRC and still do pretty well because you know you have good technique and you know how to grind out the pace and wear other people down. Just looking at it as far as demand of the event, ability of the riders. Here's the same chart I showed earlier. All right, let's jump into this. I have five key analytics. It's really six. Um, because I can't limit it to five. I tried to limit it. <laughs> so I'm going to show you some secrets here and some secret stuff. You're going to have a hard time seeing it, so I'll jump back and forth a little bit between my um, WKL4 and the screen to hopefully people can see what I'm doing. So I tend to start off with my athlete level review. Whatever I use for review is also what I'm tracking through the season. I use compare mode to track it, and I'm looking at it at least every four weeks. Somebody asked me this yesterday. The first thing I do when I set up cyclocross, because the season is so short, is I set up three, usually it's 12 weeks most, the whole kind of training, you know, you come out of racing in the summer or other sports, mountain bike road, you go in, at most it's 12 weeks. Um, maybe if you're going to nationals or you're going to worlds, it goes a little longer, so at best it's 16 weeks, but I just set up um, micro cycles by four week blocks in my time ranges, so then I can easily compare my block, and I don't even, I periodize them, I'm going to give an example, but I just call it block one, block two, block three, block four, and um, the reality is it makes comparison easy, because everything I'm about to show you, I do as my initial analytic, and is the way I track progress. So in my, and I track the progress by doing the compare function. So this is, you're going to have a little hard time seeing this, but I'm going to explain what's in here, and then I can jump over to my normal screen. So I've built a customized chart, and by the way, all these charts you might already be playing with, I pushed them up into the chart library of WKL4. So if you sync your WKL4 library, your little alert button that there's new charts will light up here, and you can find these charts by name. I left it so you could read the name here. So if you have two screens, you can play with this chart at the same time I am uh, showing it to you. So what I have here is base information for this rider, age, height, weight, phenotype. Then I have PMAX, FRC, MFTP, stamina, and TTE. So this is my base athlete metrics. What I think people are starting to really realize about WK4 is, man, what a 360 view that gives me. And it matches this when I'm on 90 days, but it also tells me this for any time period that I'm looking at. It's so much more than just what FTP was as a measurement a couple of years ago. Now we have all these cool metrics to really get a good 360 picture of the athlete. Because I said VO2 max was important, over here I have VO2 max estimates. These are model-based VO2 max estimates. So whether you're looking at it by weight or just pure, I have the numbers over here. And then um, I have max O2 pulse, so looking at how much oxygen we can carry. Again, an estimate, model derived. Drived. Well, it's not the power duration model, it's estimated by a model, which have been supplied by Dr. Andy Coggin and are pretty accurate. You know, I've seen a decent amount of people test in the lab against it and do pretty well. It's pretty close. And then I also look at fiber type. This athlete has 68.4% type 1 area. 
So again, it's probably not quite that precise. Excuse me while I take a drink. It's probably not that precise. So I'd say between 65 and 70% fiber, a slow twitch fiber for this athlete. Down here I have something new happening. So this is the WAC score. What WAC does is it compares your power profile, so actually your power duration curve, that red curve you see in so much stuff, the power duration curve, against the world class curve. You know that top white line that's up top? That top white line. And it tells you a percentage or a distance you are away from that. So it tells you a percentage or a distance you are away from that. Then using the X and Y axis, I only look at the WAC curve for an hour. I only want to know the shorter distances, and I take it off logarithmic, by the way. So it's only for an hour. So I want to look at what their mean max power against world class, well, I'm sorry, their mean max power duration curve power against world class scoring. I want to see how far away they are. And you could scroll, and I'll show you these charts, everybody, on the screen. You can scroll back and forth and see it at any given time. But I like five-minute power. So here's their five-minute raw power. Here's his five minutes watts per kilogram is 6.7 watts per kilogram for over the course of five minutes. And that's actually only 3% below world class. This is my sandbox data, so meaning I have a... To, you know, I have a bunch of WK4 setups. This is just a bunch of kind of practice data and different. And I don't clean these athletes. As a matter of fact, you can see his threshold isn't even set. Um, but I do know who some of this data is a pro that I do coach. So um, this is a mountain bike pro, a UCI mountain bike pro. So, you know, okay, that makes sense. He's uh, got a pretty good five minutes. But if I look at this time frame, look all the way out here at 40 minutes, he's only generating 307 watts. It just doesn't have all his data in here. This is not him. It's a mix of athletes. I just know that this one file creating this is him. He's a, this athlete only has a 4.4 watts per kilogram. So they are 26.9% off world class. So when I talk about the comparison for fatigue resistance, and you could see that this is a reasonably steady drop here in ability, they're only 3.1% off world class here, and then they are 26.9% here. This person has a fatigue resistance problem. If this was real, I have a feeling this is just mixed athletes, that this, you know, this might be an average, but you will see this a decent amount. So this tells me this person has two key things it tells me, right? One is, um, one is it tells me that they lack fatigue resistance, but two, it tells me they have potential. VO2 max is the limiter to your threshold. So this person has a lot more VO2 max, you can actually see it up here, to that, than they're actually performing at. So they're probably not training well, they're not training right, they might not be training at all <laughs> for that problem. Um, they're just off. So I see this and I'm like, man, I can help this person. It also immediately gives me insight in the area I might want to be working on, right? <laughs> I'm not sure I'd spend a lot of five-minute time <laughs> with this athlete right off the bat. I might spend a lot of time out here trying to raise that um, number. So somebody asked me a question. You can post your questions in the public question. Um, how do you deal with riders who have power meter on their training bikes and not on their race cross bike? You don't. It really is an answer. You can't estimate power on a cross bike. I just showed you why heart rate and cross is so difficult to use because pretty much heart rate and cross is always pegged. Um, even in training, when you're training hard for cross, it's always pegged. You need to use uh, RPE efforts at best. Just tell the athlete to go hard um, or go easy or go whatever. So without a power meter, it just, you know, you're flying blind. Okay. I'll go back and show these all at one time, but those are my two importance. I think you guys get the idea. I also, as a subset of this, Andy pushed up Coggins relative MFTP or relative VO2 max to MFTP. So what this chart does is it's tracking your estimated VO2 max over time and then it's tracking their MFTP over time. So here we can see this athlete 
you know, their MFPP, the scale is bad. I should have set this to not be zero because everything's pushed up to the top because they're changing. I know their threshold's changing more than it looks. Um, so the reality is, as VR2 Max has come up, what's actually happening is their threshold is coming up. But you see here, it starts separating a little bit. A little harder training, some other things were happening, and their threshold actually went down. And we see another step of VO2 max. This is a training phase where maybe they're not maximizing threshold under VO2 max. When you raise the ceiling, once you raise the ceiling, the ability, the limiter, the physical limiter of FTP, it's always good to do some work to push it up underneath. So I tend to use this more in when I'm looking backwards over the season or I'm looking at what the athlete has done historically. But it's a pretty good chart to look at. It gives you some insight into threshold and how close their threshold is to the ceiling. I use this peak power chart. I'm not going to spend a ton of time in this in the name of time because it should kind of jive for everybody. But this is one I like to look at. And again, I'll show you all these charts real quick in um, WK4 in a second, but it's better if I do them all at one time. So you can see. So all I'm running up top is a, the red is a power duration curve surrounded by an average power mean maximal curve. There's a purple one under there. They're just running so close you can't see them on the screen. I have a, uh, a normalized power PD curve. So I substituted average power in, with normalized power in the PD curve equation. Remember, you can't trust the numbers when they're short. You can even see here how much lower it is, right? Because the, and when I say trust, the normalized power algorithm, it's a rolling time frame. So you need a certain amount of time before it, it's creating the correct averages. And that's usually at least 10 minutes. 15 is smarter. So here I kind of have marked at 10, but you see it gets pretty accurate. And here it seems to get pretty close right in that time range. So I'm looking at, you know, average power to normalized power. What was funny, when I went to take the screenshot, I left my courser there, but I forgot to lock it down so I don't have numbers here. But what starts happening, right, in this time of year is you're not doing any hard steady efforts in cyclocross probably over, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, right? Everything's much more up and down. So I switch the focus and I make sure I pay close attention to what's happening in normalized power. And the science is use average power and use power duration curve. The art is look at the two interacting. If I would have held this correctly and I'll demo it, you'll see that there's a difference. Look and see here, here's their mean max power. Here's their average power. Look out here in an hour. Look how big that gap is to how hard this athlete has gone in a normalized way versus an average way. So I'm thinking about that all the time. So I'm not even making a conclusion yet. I'm telling you I'm really looking at it. Then I track their modeled FTP against 40-minute NP, so MMNP, mean maximal normalized power. And you see a pretty big difference there, which you'd expect. Down here, I know this is scrunched, but I'll show you here, uh, is I'm looking at MNP. Um, so I'm looking at, you can't see them, but you'll see it when I do. I'm looking at the trend line of their 5 and 40 minutes. So 5 minutes and normalized power. Sometimes I look at average power, sometimes normalized power. But I'll show you the chart in a minute because you can't see it here. It's too scrunched up. But the reality is I'm looking at the trend of those two and clearly I want them to go positive. This is an interesting chart. I need to show you the real one because I didn't realize, again, when I took the screenshot, you got to be more careful because you're dragging over the screen. I accidentally indexed off and we're missing a number here. But what I'm doing is this is a chart that just has the daily VI in yellow dots. I'm looking at the variability index. And then I'm looking at mean maximal normalized power for 40 minutes when the VI is over 1.4. So when you're highly variable, right, when you're really mixing it up and down like a cyclocross race, not everybody can make the same power like they could when they're a little bit variable or not variable at all. This will resonate with everybody to some degree, but it really depends which side of the fence you're standing on, right? So if you're one of those athletes that it's easy for you to make normalized power and hard to make average power, right, because you probably have a little more fast switch muscle and a higher FRC, it's like, yeah, no, it's way easier for me to do 45 minutes, you know, up and down when it's variable. But the reality is when it's really variable, can you do the same function? Sometimes... Other athletes who can only really don't have a lot of normalized power, have a lot of slow twitch fiber and do better in a steady state, they can really struggle 
to make power when they're forced to become highly variable. See, and that's what I want you to think about why this, to me, metric and measurement is important. Because in a cyclocross race, you, don't, you rarely get the choice because of terrain and competition to just go steady state. Now, in a crit, if you're only steady state, you can go to the front, right? Put your head down and drill it and go as hard steady as you generally can. And terrain, and you might have four, five, six corners, whatever it is, still breaks you up a little bit, but you can still apply steady pressure and hope to just hurt people, ride them off, you know, whatever it takes. Where in cross, if you try that, you still have to deal with terrain and getting on and off your bike and jumping over things and, you know, uh, slippery surface and rain and mud and all that other stuff, right? So you don't have that luxury. So measuring how your athlete actually puts out their core power, which again, I'm tracking 40 because your average cyclocross race is going to be 30 to 60 minutes. So I'm, I like 40 because also 40 is a time where you really start undergoing some physiological change, but 40 is to me is my number in the middle. So the, which I know is not mathematically in the middle, by the way, but it's my number. Um, I'm seeing how well they make power when they're over variability of 1.4 versus normal average power. So I'll show you what this is because you can't see these numbers, but this athlete has a pretty big difference. So a pretty big gap is going on. Final analytic I use at the athlete level, and I use more, but I'm just showing you some unique ones. <clears throat> this is a fatigue resistance chart for cyclocross. I'm using, this is the mean maximal normalized power curve I showed you before. Same deal, it's mean maximal normalized power curve that I showed you before. It is um, just a logarithmic scale, so one second, 20 second, then it just gets two minutes, five minutes, gets tighter and tighter. This is so it emphasizes the short stuff. This decline is, you know, since it's athlete's maximal second by second, not always in the same workout, remember, at any given time in the last 90 days, this is their decline rate off maximum. This is what's happening. Well, if you ran that against threshold, you could actually run a percentage, or against maximal, you can run a percentage of decline. I'm only tracking an hour because the cyclocross race is pretty much as long as it's going to go. And I'm looking at the rate of decline. I put this warning red line in there for everybody because anything under 15 minutes, you can just be careful trusting. I'm not saying don't. Just make sure it's making sense to you because the algorithm tends to be in line by 10 minutes, just be sure. But look, and you actually see this funny little dump, right? Right here at 15 minutes, I, you know, I bet you that is the normalized power algorithm doing that. But this athlete has a pretty steep fatigue rate. Now, is there a normal profile? And I've already got, I just got that question now. <laughs> um, no, there's not a normal profile. This is, you know, we have so much new stuff we can track that we couldn't track a year ago. Andy and myself and people, and that's why we're even doing polls. Believe it or not, those little unofficial polls are helping us start to learn things. Um, because all of this stuff is so new, we don't know what the norm is. But what I do now know is I've looked at it over about 20 cyclocross athletes, and I know this is steep. It shouldn't be so steep. Look at it over some of your athletes. As time goes by in this cyclocross season, I'm going to be looking at, I've got a couple of demo athletes, I don't coach them, but they're supplying me data. Um, so I'll see what's steep, and we'll start figuring out what's normal. The main thing I want to know, so that's one. The second thing I really want to know is as I'm training, I already see this person has a limiter. Remember, we saw it before. They have a fatigue resistance problem. As I give training, as time goes by, do I lessen the steepness of that decline? Do they become more fatigue resistance? This chart was done, um, actually I think one of the, I started this fatigue chart and then I think Ivan who was on this worked on this, Jens Berger worked on this, Donnie Key worked on this, and then I just flipped it, I took the one that was done for uh, fatigue resistance average power and I made it normalized power for cross because I'm a little more interested in looking at the normalized power because they don't go hard average. So that fatigue resistance and this really shows some interesting changes. I'm really excited to use this. Um, this wasn't a function we could do last fall. So I'm really excited to look at cyclocross data this year and see what that is. Anyone who uses it to track and you have insight, shoot me emails, tell me what you're learning. I'd love to hear it. Moving on to workout and just keeping things moving here for everybody. Um, I have 
two key charts I look at workouts, and then I'm going to give you guys some ideas of workouts to improve, because I always get that question. This is number one. So remember I talked about fatigue resistance. I was talking about quadrant analysis and looking at Q2. So cyclocross takes a lot of quadrant two type of pedaling strength. Um, really what you have in quadrant two is low cadence, high force. Don't get me wrong, if I had my option, I would always go with high cadence, high force because it's less muscular demanding. But the reality of grass, mud, slippery hills, um, changing surfaces, hence the term cross, um, cobblestones, whatever, is you find yourself generally pedaling in a bigger gear a lot more than you want to. Um, you also find in these type of terrains, when you analyze the pedaling stroke in grass, um, you find that you often are engaging your pedal stroke a little earlier. You actually are grinding a little more of a circle, so it takes a slightly different muscular demand than you might be doing in a road or a crit pedaling style. So for me, in a workout by workout way, I like tracking quadrant analysis and time in quadrant analysis by looking at the workouts with my athletes. Now this function just came in build 317. I'm using the cumulative summary function to look at it over time. So basically, I'm accumulating time in each quadrant, that's what each line is, as the ride goes on. So this is an hour and 50 minute ride. You can see this athlete put in a lot of time in Q2 high low cadence, high force. Now I found this workout specifically because it represented what I wanted to show you. And then you can see less time than other. And then this up here is summarizing the time, the percentage of the entire workout. This is raw time, and this is a percentage. So again, when you do the picture, it takes away my numbers, but I'll show you all of this in one bit. Um, you can see this is just giving the percentage of the workout. I want a lot of the workout to be in quadrant two, and as a matter of fact, when I track it, I actually prescribe it that way. So the athlete just has it in their brain. I'll tell them, hey, I want 40 or 50% of this workout to be quadrant two. Make sure you're maybe using one bigger gear if the grass has uh, been mowed and it's super tight or you're doing it on the road, you know, use a bigger gear or do it on a course that forces you to pedal a little harder. So it's a really cool chart. It's in your chart library. Take a look. This is a matches burn chart. Again, the same people. Ivan's on this. Jens Berger did it. Donnie Key. Um, everybody, a bunch of people kind of contributed. I just simplified it for cross. And all I'm really tracking here is matches above FRC. Now, the yellow is just a simple, um, it's just a simple uh, power line. And the deep grays are when this person is burning a match and the length of the match. So here you can see they're actually doing micro intervals. You can actually see the well-defined match over FRC they're burning. So it's pretty cool. Uh, the gray, I think, is over FTP, I mean. So here I'm counting their FRC match counts. So this is tracking repeatability, and it's what I want to do with my athletes. I want to see in a workout by workout level how much repeatability can they withstand. We now are going to have the ability, you know, here to be able to pull this up to the athlete level and literally track how many matches per workout. So that's common. That's part of the athlete range, workout range, expression improvement we made in the last build. So that'll be pretty cool when we can do it. But for now, I'm tracking it at the workout level and just keeping track. So let's talk about some training targets. I always get the question, I had a bunch coming in here, what are some workouts that I might do to build these things that I focus on? So I'll do this pretty quick. First off, I always think specificity. I encourage my athletes to go out and build three local courses. So here in the US, um, we always have a school. We always have a park. It's easy for us to get to. I see a pretty broad array of international uh, athletes here. So it, it, And generally, I've, everybody has the same kind of setup. Course one is a five-minute loop at the local school, at the park, at a place you can ride, maybe even, you know, on a, on a course that's already pre-marked. You know, I know places here have pre-built cyclocross courses, like Boulder. So five-minute loop, pavement, once complete. So it sort of starts and ends on pavement, because it's best at times to do your recovery on pavement. One set of obstacles. And you can just make up the obstacles, which I'll show you in one moment. Course two is another five-minute loop with three short, steep climbs. And my last course is like a 20-minute loop. Again, cyclocross is raw, right? I don't care if it's a four and a half minute or 5.15 or whatever. Yeah, you know, don't make cyclocross too precise. It's fun. It's right around the grass. It is what it is. So I'm just giving these as examples. The easiest way to do this, um, 
I use Google with my athletes. So a lot of times I'll just go to Google, I'll capture the screenshot of a local area, and I'll mark up a course like, hey, could you do this? Athletes love that, coaches. This is actually my core, one of my courses, so it's easy for me to do. I marked it up to show one of my athletes how to do it. Because Google allows you to see it up here and say, oh, you know, if I, I start, like I, my little, my course is I start here, I go here, I go through this little runway, I go around here, I go around the field, whoop, go through that park, you know, you get it. Then I have two things on my course. This is an old running track, a 400-yard running track, um, which was cinders, but now is grown over with grass. So it's a great place for me to do intervals and circles. And this is my steep hill course. This is a really steep hill. You can't see it here, but I know it because I've been there. So this is my steep hill course. So think like this. As a coach, this is a cool little thing, you know, when you're looking for your courses to help your athletes think this out and get them doing the right training, the specific training. When it comes to training, I'm doing a periodization. Base build perform, not a lot of complexity here. It's short and sweet and to the point. If they have a base period, I would call that June to August. A lot of cyclocross racers are already doing road race or mountain bike, so they're doing something else. So it's not always something you get to have or should do. But you got to think about it if they're not, if you're specializing. And if you're going to worlds, the lateness of the worlds, which is very few in the marketplace. I know hundreds of people go to worlds, but there's you know a lot more people that are wrapping up their season in late November, early December. High volume, remember my aerobic base, get it if you can get it. Here's the time where you're actually putting good aerobic fitness as a foundation so you can do your high intensity training. I like a lot of SST in the grass. Do it in the grass so you're getting that that muscular demand the way the pedaling stroke goes. But don't do them all steady state. Do some bursts in there. I'm going to show you an example. But mix it up a little. Wind-ups are great. Wind-ups are just big gear accelerations. On your cross bike, get in the grass. Um, do a little, get in a big gear. Um, depends, cross gearing is so extreme, it's hard to even explain. Um, but just a big gear. Um, do a track stand and then grind it up to over 90 RPM. Great strength builder because it also builds strength as you're using force early, and then it's neuromuscular power later as you're getting over, you know, 90, 95 RPM. And run, Forrest, run. I mean, so many people do their base work or even come into their first race or two, and they haven't done any running. You need a little running in your base and your build to make sure that you're able to handle the demands of jumping off your bike and running with it. In the build period, we move to high intensity. High intensity interval training is the core. Don't burn a lot of time wasting other stuff. You need a little bit of aerobic work, don't get me wrong, and a little bit of endurance, but to really focus on high intensity intervals, high intensity when you're going hard. FRC focused, I'll give you some examples, but you know this is focus. Repeats, you're always pushing the envelope of repeat. During this season, I am a lot less focused, and those who know me know that this is always my way. I'm not always trying to push up the FRC FTP power. I'd much rather have, see an athlete be able to withstand one or two more intervals than do, you know, just five more watts or even 10 more watts in the same interval set. Get them to do more repeats. More fatigue resistance will create better results. Sprints, I don't mean sprints on the bike. I should have qualified this. I mean running. Get off the bike and do some harder running. Do easier running here, harder running here. Because guess what happens in a race? You run hard. And then do everything on course. And this is really perform, right? Race Saturday, race Sunday, rest Monday, Tuesday, uh, come back Wednesday, hard race workout Thursday, taper Friday, you know, and sometimes it's hard Wednesday, whatever you guys do. Here I do move from FRC FTP to FRC PMAX, so I'm doing harder stuff. Running in this vein, meh, it's not that important. You really, the reality is you've gotten all your running gain. If you're racing once or twice a weekend, you're probably getting enough running because your training time and you need rest is so limited. I'm not doing a lot of um, running at this stage. And again, on course. So what type of workouts would I do in this time frame? Here's two. So here's a cyclocross SST with three times obstacles. So on my 20-minute course, I'm doing two times 20 SST. The difference is I'm doing, I'm prescribing one set of barriers, and you can do four times on your five-minute course, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm doing one set of obstacles about every five minutes, some type of sand or barrier, an alligator pit, whatever floats your boat. 
but make sure they're getting off and running for 10 to 30 seconds every five minutes-ish. doesn't have to be exact. Remember my point, it's a raw sport. Then they warm down. Here's a good tip. I should have put this in here. You could do this workout, right? And then after they do their time times 20, have them run with their bike for five minutes, a couple of laps around the soccer field with their bike. It's a pain in the butt. Nobody wants to run with your bike, but yet that's the motion you're doing in a cyclocross race. They don't have to run hard. They can run easy, just jog with their bike, then jump back on and warm down. Great way to blend running like a cyclocross brick. So when I prescribe them, that's actually what I call it, a CX brick. You can also do endurance with big gear. This is just get on your course, ride an hour of good, healthy endurance, but vary your cadence of five minutes high cadence and five minutes low cadence and grind out the power. So big gear work. Be careful if your knees are bad. Now as we move into the build phase, I start to get a little more specific. I'm going to start an FRC FTP edge interval. So if you've been to my webinars before, you know what I mean by edge, but I'll describe it again. I have an example here of an athlete's. So get a good warm up and then do three to eight, three to eight times FRC FTP edge intervals. So what you're looking for is look at their FRC FTP zone. The edge is the upper edge. So their power target is 366 to 341. And then their time target is 1920 to 140. So the upper edge is 541 to 140. So if you remember the way I teach edge intervals, give them about a 10 watt range on the top. So I take the 540, I round out the one so the athlete can remember it. And I take 530 to 540. And then as I say, reduce the time a little bit here because we're doing intensive intervals. So I make it a minute 30. Again, I'm also trying to make it simple in the brain because the reality is if the athlete's doing this on course or you know on a little hill somewhere or whatever they're doing, we get be careful of that over precision of exactly a minute 30. I want them going close to the edge. That's what you're really doing, right? You want them walking right up to the edge. That's a great way to think about edge intervals. At least five minutes rest in between. I really want them to have a great recovery. I would rest up to 10 minutes in between, except typically in the cyclocross season, by the time you're in build, the days are short, and you just don't have the time. But if they do have the time, let them rest to a pretty good recovery, all the way up to a four to one ratio of that edge. Maybe even a little more. More and more evidence is showing resting and going harder in intervals is really good than a simple warm down. Second workout, this is a mixed workout. So cross 30 second running micros. So basically these are good warm up, two to four 10 minute intervals. And what the interval is, is you just keep repeating this pattern until 10 minutes. So you ride your bike 30 seconds hard, then you ride your bike 30 seconds easy, dismount, run hard for 30 seconds, remount, pedal hard for 30, or pedal easy for 30 seconds, and start back up here. Pedal hard for 30 seconds, pedal easy for 30 seconds, run hard for 30 seconds. So you're basically repeating these four five times in 10 minutes. That's one interval. So it's 10 minutes of micro, right? What you're really doing is you're doing a 30 second on, 30 second off, 30 second on for running, 30 second off. 30 second on, 30 second off, 30 second on for running, and then warm down. Here's a great way to blend your sprint running. Remember I said sprint running. You're running hard in here and you're blending into your workout and you're actually doing the natural behaviors that a cyclocross person has to have in their skill set, getting on and off their bike and going hard. All right, performance. In the performance phase, edge intervals, same deal. I just used the Pmax FRC edge. For this person, that's 1,069 watts in 10 seconds. So I'm making it easy, 1,000 watts, 10 seconds. At that stage, you're not really reading your power meter, right? You're just drilling it and going hard anyway. So the reality is that's just a target. What I do when we go to Pmax or FRC Pmax, do these on a little hill. So that's where I use my steep hills. In other, I use them in running and other deals. But this is something I want to do on a steep hill. Um, what you find in a steep hill when you're doing in the grass cyclocross, the athlete's uh, cadence tends to stall out. It's way harder to maintain the speed of a sprint up a grass hill on a cross bike than it is to maintain the speed of a sprint up a, on a road bike on a paved hill. So they tend to stall and actually start grinding a little more. That's good here because that's what's going to happen to you generally in the race. 
Don't get me wrong, I'd rather have you shift, but the reality is a lot of times to get traction or just because you're already tired and your brain can't function enough to shift, <laughs> um, you end up grinding anyway. So you're actually preparing for the actual demand a little bit better and you're building some strength in there, some, some slow grind, some force type of strength. Now the other workout is also my repeatability test. So this is a test I've used for repeatability in, in all, I use it in road racers, crit racers, and cycle cross racers, and mountain bike racers. It's a really great workout. This goes to Dr. Coggin's statement that training is racing and racing is training. Absolutely true. So when you have workouts that give you insight, testable insight to an athlete, and is a really hard workout, you get a double advantage. So the reality is, right, this is a good one. So here's the workout. It's a little confusing, but I think you guys will get it. Really good warm-up. And do this when you're fresh, by the way. Great when you're fresh, coming back after like maybe a little time off or an extra rest day. These are declining sprint intervals. And what you do is one interval. This is one interval we're looking at. And you do this continuously. So you go hard for 10 seconds. Don't even worry about power. Just tell your athlete to go hard. Trust me, it'll work. It'll find its natural range. Um, so go hard. Sprint for 10 seconds. Rest for a full minute. Go hard for 20 seconds, rest for a full minute. Go hard for 30 seconds, rest for a full minute. 40, go hard 40 seconds, rest for a full minute. Go hard for 50 seconds, rest for a full minute. Then finish the interval by going hard for one minute. That's one interval. One interval. That's really hard. It's a longer time. It takes some time, stuff like that. But watch. There are people who can't get through one of these. It doesn't look like it's going to be that hard because you look at these short time frames here and you're like, well, I'll be fully recovered. Okay, <laughs> let me know how that works out. Um, give this a try if you haven't done this. This is a great test for every coach and every, to, to try this workout. Good for crits racers also, by the way. Good for everybody, but this is more about building um, endurance. This is an extensive, it's not intensive. You won't go anywhere near max. Um, it's more of an extensive a repeatability builder. Because remember, what we're also testing is repeat, or what we are testing is repeatability. Then in this test control, I force, I allow them to only rest for five minutes in my test. But in a workout, you can do a five to ten minute rest and then repeat. And just have them do as many as they can until they crack. And trust me, they'll know. When they're done, you're done with this workout. Because you'll lay on the side of the road, you'll throw up and like I say, you're going to swear you'll never come to one of my webinars and get any training advice again <laughs> um, because it's really hard. When you're done, you're done. So what I measure, I do this at least every four weeks because it's a good workout too. So I might do it a little more. And every time I'm doing it, what I'm really measuring is how deep the athlete – I mean, I'm looking at the power and the numbers, don't get me wrong. But I'm scoring repeatability based on the workout. And I want them to be able to do a little more, get a little deeper – and a little deeper means they might crack. Most people, the first time they do this, might get two done. If you have a high FRC, you might get to two and a half. Very few people get to three. And if you get to three the first time, you're probably not going hard enough. You're cheating. Go hard. Um, after training and stuff like that, I've never seen anybody do more than four. As a matter of fact, I used to coach Dr. Stephen Chung uh, up in Canada from Pez. You probably know him from Pez or stuff like that. But he also does a lot of studies. And this uh, Stephen had amazing repeatability. And he was the only person I've ever seen get to four intervals and be able to complete four. I still swear he was holding back a little, but he's the only person I've ever seen get through four. So know where they crack. Like, did they crack here at the 30-second, the 40-second? And it actually gives you a measurable. Why is the interval so hard? Probably a lot of people here know. It really loads lactate. And your body has to deal with a lot of lactate and go hard again. And then more lactate and go hard again. So you don't clear all the lactate in the one minute. You might recover your, your heart rate and your, your breathing threshold. But the lactate's still there. And it just builds and builds and builds based on the way you're doing it. So very challenging that way. So there's some workouts for each step. Um, that pretty much concludes my presentation. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm capable of a 30-minute webinar. It just might not ever happen. <laughs> I tried, you guys. But, you know, the problem is if you, the answers are too short or the information is too low, it just doesn't work. All of the charts that you see today are up in um, the chart library. So you can use it if you want. Um, you can download them and be playing with them. You might have already been doing it while I was presenting. 
to just give you a quick look, um, here's a test, a sandbox athlete doing the same thing. Um, there's the 40-minute VI. I, I messed with the order of this because I screwed it up last night, but you can see the difference there, 383, 343. This person puts out different power when the variability gets high. Here's the actual. This was the one I had in the demo. So you see here how steep it is. You can see I see the percentages up here. Doing it live, you can see I can actually see the numbers. Here I was showing you the APNP. So you can, and guys, I'm done. I'm just going over these. You can drop off if your schedule is pressed. But here you see uh, look how much different this is. They're generating 358 watts normalized power versus only 290. This person, uh, and this isn't one person, this is a mix of people, why it looks so odd, but it really makes a great example. You'll see this in a uh, cyclocross season because you don't go steady state hard for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, or whatever, you just don't see it. So it really helps you focus on paying attention. I can see this person's 40 minute trend is increasing. I know that's probably a little hard to see, but it's moving up to the right, and so is their five minute trend. Here's the profile. This is a pretty intensive report, so it can take a little time to study. You can see I can drag over it. So you notice the percentage, the numbers changing there. So this person, then you see them really dropping off out here. Their drop off really starts, look, in that 40 minute range. That's always why I use 40 minutes, pretty big drop off. So all kinds of cool things for you guys to use. Um, I showed there at the end of that slide, there's some educational resources. You guys, one of the things that people are discovering, and I should have done a better job of promoting it, on that link, um, in this link, you have this great link. Here, actually, I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to um, reply to this question. So I'm putting it in your question box. So if you clicked on it right now, it'll take you there. Um, that I sent it all. And the reality is, you have this great educational center with tutorials, how-to videos, all the recorded webinars and seminars, ebooks. Andy and I are working on a couple new ebooks for everybody coming down the pipe. All the in-depth articles on the blog, and then here's all the upcoming events. So here's our. And if you notice, I am for the Euro Group scheduling two every time now. So you guys, if I'm next time I run over in Europe, somebody owes me a, a pint. Um, we do have the ultimate season review coming up. I'm hoping to have a guest speaker and have some fun in this one. We have WK4 University. If you're in the States, great opportunity to learn out in Boulder. Um, this is really the great fundamental education of how to use WK4. Um, I will be presenting at the USAC Cycling Summit if any of you guys are coming here. I'll be presenting analytics how to use analytics and endurance training. And there's a lot of other people presenting in WKL4 on the agenda. Click there for more information. Um, University of Indiana and Purdue, uh, through the National Institute of Fitness and Strength, NIFS, I think I have that right, has asked Andy and I to come and do a presentation on innovations and in training with power for endurance sports. It's really, you know, with power running meters and things like that coming. They wanted us to come and show cutting edge stuff, like what's the future. So this is actually really cool. Andy and I are excited about this. And now we have Garmin has jumped in and uh, Quark has jumped in and they're going to be demoing some new cool stuff here that nobody's seen. And I know probably you guys have seen the Quark teasers. Well, they have more coming. So they're going to be there. They just got announced as a sponsor and that's going to be coming out. It's going to be Andy Dean Golich, who is the um, chief physiologist with Carmichael Training Systems. And actually, Dean is Mara Abbott's coach. So if you're watching all the articles on Mara Abbott at the Olympics, who came in fourth in the heartbreaking women's road race, um, and the coach she was talking about is Dean. Um, also, my athlete, Amber Nieben, is going to be there. So Amber is a former world champ and uh, two-time Olympian and uh, currently still racing, you know, pro. So she'll be there. And actually, Bobby Julek, um, who a lot of you would know from the Tour de France and back in the heyday of some American cycling. So Bobby will be there. They're going to be talking about, you know, how they've evolved with power from their career into their coaching careers. So all kinds of cool stuff going on there. And we've been asked to present in New York. Uh, uh, Joe Bacana and his group in New York City are putting on a great training day. He asked me to come and do a presentation, which I'll be doing. All of these for the US people, they have CEUs. They're cr everything on here, actually, 
<coughs> excuse me, has USAC and USAT CEUs in a lot of them. So look up what they are. So back to the original point, mark this page. This is always dynamic content. We're always adding to the, tu the tutorial stays the same. There's always new videos coming. There's always new recorded webinars and seminars. There's more eBooks coming. And then here's the schedule of all the places you come and see and learn about this cutting edge stuff. If you're newer with WKL4, Training Peaks University, I'm presenting, Dean's presenting, um, Dave Shell is presenting. We have all kinds of great visitors there. Um, come and see it. If you really experienced with, and you know you're kind of basics and stuff like that, you want to see what's on the innovative stretch, coming to the innovations conference, really, uh, we're going to show you the future. Go look that up. Here, it's, uh, you look at the schedule, besides all these great speakers, and there's the secret. So we are going to introduce a new way, an evolution of measuring training stress at this conference. And then you'll see uh, a continued evolution of taking the Training Peaks metrics, TSS and what goes into PMC and CTO and ATO and everything else, and evolving that towards something new for the future. So that's all the things in educational opportunities. The reason I was kind of going over that is I got some more questions coming in while that was, I usually do. So let's see. So Doug, good advice. So Doug's giving some advice. Something to add during rest periods between intervals for cyclocross is wrist strength training. That's a great point. You guys, arm and wrist weakness is a lot of the times people struggle with the cyclocross. It's like, oh, I'm only picking up a bike, I'm only controlling it, but man, that's such a fatiguing thing. So what Doug is suggesting is you get a baseball bat and some twine with a brick or similar attached with arms out in front of you, the bat, and just and over and lift the brick by winding the twine around the bat. When the brick is wound up, let it back down, jump back on, and continue. Fatigued skills work really improves uh, with strong wrists. So he's totally right. Great advice. You know, being able to control your bike once your hands and wrists are going extremely numb. That's one of the demands of cyclocross that you tend not to have in road cycling. So good advice. All right, you guys, I think that wraps it up. Any questions you might have, you can always feel free to join the Facebook group. That's a great place to ask questions. It's really got a lot of information into it. Facebook has a new search in that book, in that Facebook, in, that, uh, in the groups. Use the search function. It really works great. Just put your topic in there, and you tend to find a lot of already posts on it. Any questions, let me know. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Have a great night.